everybody, welcome to the latest episode of You Know What. I'm not even gonna spoil it yet. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get this intro right so I can't get yelled at. There's no gum in the mouth, right? A little wind, I'm gonna slow down so you guys make sure you guys can hear me. So, not a ton of topics to jump into, but a couple things. Laura Morgan's book, Coyote and the Pig. Coming out, that's not gum, I promise. It's just like a raspberry seed. Don't yell at me, Laura. I'm innocent. Um, no gum. Ah. So Laura's Coyote and the Pig comes out, I think, next week. The first edition. Amazing, crazy, finally here. Super excited for her. Um, the Good Dog's first book ever. Uh, we're hard at work on it, and uh, we're shooting really, really, really hard for a Christmas release. So fingers crossed we'll get there. Fingers really, I mean, they're there's like toes crossed too. It's a, it's a lot of crossing. Anyways, so I don't want to belabor this. Um, hopefully you guys can hear me through the wind and everything like that. I'm going to try not to get run over while talking with you guys. But uh, we're going to have a little fun with this Q&A, uh, different location Q&A. So let's just jump into it. What do you say? Where's my gum? Just kidding. Hey everybody, it's Sean from The Good Dog. And to my left, my far, 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 far left is the lovely Laura Morgan. And this stuff, all of this crazy stuff is the Good Dogs q and I'm gonna get up close so you can hear me. The Good Dogs Q&A, Saturday episode. Please don't hit me. Episode number 107. And I'm gonna need Laura to do the fingers on this one so I can't get yelled at but uh, I don't have any free hands. Like, you see down here, like, that's two for like seven. So if Laura wants to put up like 105, I'll add those two. That's my contribution. Anyways, so, intro is hopefully accomplished. And uh, Laura, what do you say we, uh, unless you've got something interesting, if you've got something inter interesting to say, please share it. Otherwise, let's jam and jump on into the show with the first question. All right, let's roll. Hey guys! Well, I'm not on a bike. I'm definitely not flying around the French Quarter or the Marigny and doing all the things that Sean's doing. That's super fun. But what I can say is that it's raining here, which isn't very exciting for a lot of people, but for us in Southern California, it's the best. Um, that's all I really have to say. Uh, Sean talked about the coyote and the pig. That's awesome. He also talked about our book that's going to come out. I promise it's going to happen by Christmas. I just have this feeling that we're going to make it happen. So, um, anyway, uh, yeah, let's just jump into the show. I think I'm going to have the girls read the questions and then we're going to answer them. So, um, the one thing I did want to show was my nails, my chrome nails, which I got talked into. You can see them close. They're like silver and they like, the way they do them is they paint them black and then they put this powder on them. And I literally like was so excited about them and then about one day later I was like, now what? Now I have chrome nails. What am I gonna do with this? So basically, um, that's all I got for you. Nothing really exciting, just a ton of work going on. And um, yeah, lots of doggies and all that good stuff coming in. So, uh, and I know Sean's doing the same. So things are crazy, but we'll jump right into the show. Okay, so I'm gonna read question one. Question one comes from Jeanette. Jeanette says, hi Sean and Laura, I desperately need your help. Another trainer and I have been trying to put our heads together as how to best help a three month old pity puppy with severe food aggression. He bites to the point of breaking skin. The owners have tried hand feeding and he snarls throughout the meal. OMG. He's unfazed by mild leash corrections and the pet corrector. We watched Jeff Gelman's excellent YouTube video on food aggression and resource guarding. Jeff talks about teaching out and using leash pressure when needed, um, although it was on an adult dog. He's a little young for an e-collar. Would a prong collar be appropriate for now? He needs strong corrections for such snotty behavior that can become dangerous as he gets bigger. The owners have been told that he needs structure ASAP. Please give advice on how you would proceed. Much appreciated. Okay, so we've got Jeanette. We're probably gonna have some loud motorcycle drivers riding by, and they'll, I'm sure, be sure 
to do a little revving of their engines just for us. Let's wait. Okay guys, I found a nice little quiet spot for the first question. So the first question, uh, Jeanette, thank you Laura for reading that. So we've got this three month old pup with all this resource guarding stuff. We've got notes because you know how I roll. I always roll with notes. Okay, so first thing would be I'd forget the hand feeding. Obviously the hand feeding isn't working. It's not getting anywhere and most likely it's showing you guys uh, or the owners I should say or whoever's doing it in a very soft kind of, um, what's the word? Um, just a trying too hard, soft kind of light, which is obviously not gonna serve the dog uh, human relationship. Um, it's, it's shown that obviously it's not working, the dog's biting, he's, leaving, he's actually breaking skin, so it's, it's pretty serious stuff. Um, it's unusual for a dog at this age, three months, to be exhibiting this kind of behavior, but we got it, right? So um, if they plan to hold on to this dog and they wanna make things better, then it's time to get down to some serious business. So, that said, um, first of all, I'd love to know what kind of structure, I know you, you hinted at or, or, or shared that they were, the owners were starting to get into some structure stuff, but that really freaks me out because that means that like they're just starting. That means that probably a lot of this, there might be a genetic component and an attitude component, but there's also most likely a structure relationship breakdown kind of moment or moments that are going on. And so, yeah. people walking by, trying to figure out what the hell I'm doing. Um, so most likely the relationship stuff has contributed considerably to this dog feeling entitled to, he's probably been babied and spoiled, I'm taking a big leap, but I would assume he's probably been baby and spoiled and felt empowered and entitled to set limits on humans. Humans. Now, if that's not the case, if that's, if it's just like they've been awesome owners and they've set structure and rules and guidance and leadership from the get and they're getting this, this is a pretty serious situation. But I'm gonna assume that it's the alternate alternative. I'm gonna assume that it's the owners having the bad combination, right? Which is a dog who's predisposed to being firm and owners that are predisposed to being soft. That's what I'm gonna assume is, is what's cooking here. So, that all said, I'd love to know what that structure, what the relationship, what all that looks like. What kind of baby and what kind of spoiling. Like, I'd love to know the true dirt on that um, to find out how much, of a, how much of a player it is in what's going on. Um, so, he obviously needs a firm conversation. This whole kind of like, because he's a puppy, we're going to hand feed him and like, you know, try and find a, try and find a way past this serious behavior where he's actually causing people to, he's breaking skin and causing people to bleed. Um, we need a firm conversation regardless of what age he is at this point. I mean like a three month old puppy doing this kind of damage needs to have a firm no. And, and the cool thing is, um, Jeanette actually said that that needs to be part of the conversation. So it's cool that we're on the same page with that. The question is how do you go about doing that? Prong collar stuff, I find a lot of times for resource guarding can be really challenging. Um, it can work, it can definitely work with typically with softer dogs. Dogs that are more prone to push back, more prone to, to take exception with leadership or if the relationship's really in the dumps. Prong collar stuff oftentimes will cause more more pushback, more confrontational, combative stuff where the e-collar will be more neutral and to be honest, will be far more mild on the dog. So we've trained three-month-old dogs uh, on e-collar. So it's not that three-month-old dog is, is beyond the realm of doing e-collar work. This three-month-old dog might lose its life if he's not able to get into a better space. So I would kind of, I would shift gears tremendously and I would shoot for, if, if he came into our board and train, we do, all the regular stuff we would do all the leadership all the structure all the guidance all the full obedience training to get his head in the right space being respectful and deferential to human beings and then we do specific stuff with the out command around food resources anything the dog was interested in or nasty with and we'd use the e-collar to create the out command just like you said about Jeff's video and we teach even a three-month-old puppy who's going to be a four-month five-month six-month-old puppy and like I said we'll do worse damage and worse damage it might end up being put to sleep because of it, I would get rid of it right now. I would sort it out. And it's a simple process of sharing a consequence for crappy behavior and then patterning the dog that when you hear this word out, you move away from the object. Both mentally and physically, you move away, you disengage from the object. So that's where I would head with this. 
sorry, we had a little glitch in the matrix there. That's where I would head with this. Um, you can, like I said, you can try the prong, but you might get you might get yourself way more pushback with the prong. But obviously, it's a cheap cheap way to go for thirty bucks. You can give it a shot and see what you get. But my suspicion is the e-collar would be more valuable, and most likely this dog will need full e-collar training, a full comprehensive e-collar program in order to get into a good space and out of the crappy space that he's in. So that's kind of where I'm at with that. Um, like, yeah, nobody wants to have to be like tough with a three-month-old pup that I'm sure looks cute and all this stuff, but that three-month-old pup is doing serious damage. That three-month-old pup is gonna get bigger, stronger, and more dangerous if this doesn't get turned around ASAP. So that's my recommendation. Full structure, full rules, full program, e-collar program for the, com for, the complete, for the complete picture, and then also e-collar out and a lot of resource guarding protocols done over and over again. Get rid of the hand feeding, forget it. That There's no like, you're not gonna make him not wanna bite you over that. You need to tell him no to get him to stop biting you or whoever it is that he's biting. He needs a firm no, and I would deliver that with an e-collar. It'll be the most neutral and most effective. Hope that helps, guys. Can one of you read? Can you guys stop looking at pictures of Frenchies and stuff? <laughs> Shelby wants one. <laughs> Can you read something for me? Come here, one of you. Do I say this question? Yeah, say question number two. Okay. okay. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. This is question number two from Casey. Hello, my two favorite dog people. It's been too long. I have an interesting conundrum that I'm hoping you can shed some light on. I've been introducing Trigger, who is now 10 months old, to my new horse, and neither has any fears about the other. Which is great, but I wonder about Trigger walking too close to the horse when we're all out on the trail. He doesn't seem to realize that giant hooves can hurt him, and I'd rather he not learn that lesson the hard way. How do I keep him somewhat close and following us but discourage him from wandering directly in front of or behind the horse? Also, are you guys ever going to update the podcast feed? Yeah, I'm going to cheat and sneak in a second question because that's how I roll. Love you guys. <laughs> oh, I didn't answer that. So can you answer her right now and just tell her that yes, we are going to update the podcast feed. Like type it? No. Or say, say it. Say it right now. <laughs> yes, we're going to update the podcast. Say we'll do it today. We'll do it today. Okay. <laughs> okay, guys. I'm out on my walk. Sun's starting to come out. It was raining, but... um sun's out now okay so this question is from Casey obviously the question about horses and about getting her dog heel they know I'm not listening they're watching them so it's so cool Casey that you can be riding the horse and you can have the dogs next to you that's really like the most awesome thing about e-collar is that the icing on the cake with it is so much more than just like correcting your dog or getting rid of bad behaviors that you don't like wow that's loud um but you get to have so much off-leash freedom and and fun stuff like that so with the actual like keeping the bubble around the horse you're just gonna have to do exactly that so for instance if you have your dog walking next to you and he starts to move into the path of the horse, you wanna correct. Now, what I would do is correct really low for this to start, and most likely your dog's gonna stop, he's gonna move back, he's going to like, especially if he's really trained in it, he's gonna kinda of move out of the way. What we wanna create is basically just a bubble right around the horse. So as the dog starts to get close to the horse, whether in front of it or to the side, you want to correct. Now, what I don't want you to do is go out and practice this when you're like in a hurry or when it's the first time out or anything like that. We want you to go out, just have the horse in like a slow walk and have him right next to you in a place where you can actually control the situation. We don't want you to get the dog confused by moving too fast or anything like that. 
What I would really advise is probably that you have a real clear distinction between like your normal heel and the loose kind of walking in a bubble right around you. So what I mean by that is that when I walk my dogs right now, they're obviously in the heel command doing their thing. But when we're out at the park, they're kind of in like a loose formation, like moving freely and being able to do whatever they want. And then I call them into me whenever it's time to, um, to come closer to me, right? So by having that looser bubble around your horse, then you can actually correct for any time like the dog comes too far in. My guess is, unless you're seeing this already, my guess is that your dog is going to be pretty intuitive with the horse and with what's happening when you're walking with the horse. So to put it all together, I would start slow. You're walking with the horse in a space that you can actually control with your dog kind of like moving freely about the cabin, if you will, kind of in a bubble around you guys. And then start practicing in a kind of, like I said, an environment that you can actually control, not like out on a trail where you might see other people or horses or whatever, or where you're kind of in like a pressure situation. Do it more like, okay, I have some time now, I'm gonna actually train. And then <clears throat> keep them in a loose formation. And then as he starts to move, ooh, sounds like a client of ours, let's go. Um, as he starts to move into your space, you wanna do a low level tap on the e-collar and just have him move out of your space. Does that make sense? It's a weird one, but <clears throat> my guess is that you're gonna be okay. The reason why I kind of have done this, the reason why I know about this, I don't have horses, but what I will say is that <clears throat> I go bike riding with my dogs and I do the exact same thing. So because they're used to doing like a bubble ride around me at the park that I take them bike riding, they actually stay in that bubble and if they start to move into the wheels too much, which I have when they get distracted, I correct them and they actually just move back to where they were before. So if I had them in a really strict heel right next to me as I biked, and this is without leashes, I might have a little bit less leeway in terms of correcting that stuff because they might just slow down. They're like, well, what does that correction mean? You know? So keep that bubble, correct really low level, do it in a really controlled setting first and try that, and then go from there and let us know how it goes. I'd love to see this. I wanna see this horseback riding stuff. All right, thanks Casey. Okay, thanks Laura for uh, handling Casey Naklik's uh, question. Casey's been a long time follower, so it's always nice to have her back. And uh, thanks for answering that. Let's jump into question number three. <laughs> so say question number three. Question number three from Rhonda. Hey guys, I'm back. Hi. <laughs> I have had my two and a half GSD half, oh, half Great Pyrenees dog on an e-collar and I'm seeing some stuff, awesome stuff from them. Though it did take some time to adjust to a double dog remote. I definitely hit the wrong button. Wait, I definitely hit the wrong dog button more than once, but I'm a pro now. <laughs> Okay, her question is, um, with her female who has leash aggression towards dog, she no longer drags her around, but it seems like I have to dial up her super high to get her attention or have her quit barking lunging. Um, I can't seem to find the right level. She works inside at eight and outside with no distractions at 20. With, distract with distractions, um, 30. I tried all those levels with no results. I even started out at 60 to try to cap bit not wanting to amp her up. She yelps but still pulls the leash and barks growls at other dogs. I try walking to her wait, I try walking to other side of the street to give distance, but she will react if that dog barks or it's at the end of the leash trying to get to them. Um I'm just lost at the steps to take 
to help her successfully avoid other, uh, other dogs. Do I dial up higher even though she yelps like I'm hurting her? Or, um, oh, some of the issues have been my fault too. Not seeing a dog and probably missing some of her mischief before the explosion. <laughs> Okay, so question number three, we've got Rhonda and a big truck. Get out of here, I'm trying to film. Anyways, we've got Rhonda with a, a GSD Pyrenees uh, mix with uh, reactivity and apparently a lot of past, like really like tough behaviors. Uh, she's done e-collar work and got the dog, uh, two dogs, I think she's got uh, both into a great space. Things are looking really nice. Problem is the Pyrenees GSD mix that she's got in the mix is um, having a lot of problems with reactivity still. So um, there's talk about correcting, like I think at like eight inside the house, uh, 20 for like mild distractions, and then 30 for like busy street corners or something like that. So that tells me pretty straight away that you've got a firmer dog. If the dog is needing a 30, I'm, I'm imagining you're on a mini educator, uh, which is a soft collar by the way, but if, if your dog is needing 30, a 30 level correction on, um, on a mini for just being on a busy street, you got probably a firm dog slash an anxious high strung dog. Um, so that's probably what's cooking and so that anxiety, that high energy, that kind of like um, Kind of escalated state is pushing through those corrections even when there's no dog dogs present you're needing higher levels than a lot of dogs so I'd say just out of the gate you've got a firmer dog that needs higher level corrections so that would also change my view on what I need to do correction wise for the dog for uh, for any kind of like dog reactivity stuff so you said that you felt like you were going pretty high at 60 and that your dog would yelp and you're like, oh, should I go higher? And like, it sounds like it's hurting her. Well, but if your dog's still reacting, it's obviously not uncomfortable enough. If your dog is still reacting and you're correcting at 60, you've either moved too slow and your dog is too escalated or you've gotten there quick, but your dog doesn't care enough about that consequence level to actually change its behavior and make a different decision. So 60 is really not that big of a deal for stronger, firmer, more reactive, more high-strung dogs. We've got dogs that have to go to the boss, right? So some dogs, they have to go to the boss um, because the mini educator just isn't enough. And it's not, it's not, it's not like, you know, I think I always say it's like 95% of dogs are on mini educators and 5% are on like bosses and it might even be less than that, but they're out there. And so what I would do and what I always suggest to clients is don't worry about that number. What you're looking for is a state change in your dog. Nobody likes to hear their dog yelp. Nobody wants to hear a vocalization. But the truth of the matter is if you've got a bunch of heavy duty reactivity going on, and your dog's yelping when it's being corrected, it's not really caring about that correction. It's vocalizing, it's probably startled, it's probably uncomfortable, but it's, oh, we got a cute little guest star walking by. There we go. Cute little pity. So, uh, anyways, jumping back in. So, I would, I would be looking for the state change. I would not be so concerned about the number. Nobody wants to hear their dog vocalize or, you know, sound like they're hurt. But the reality is, is that, like Laura always said, if it was so uncomfortable, guess what? Your dog would stop doing it, right? So the dog is obviously making a choice that the reactivity is more rewarding in that moment than the correction is capping or, or becoming not rewarding. I don't even have a good fancy word for that. Um, so what I would do is I would not be looking at the 60. What I would be doing is I would be looking at like, let's move on that. Let's find a level your dog really cares about. And, and whether that's uh, jumping straight to 60 or jump, jumping straight to 80 or jumping straight to 90 or 100, you've got to figure it out. I'm not telling you to go and blast your dog to kingdom come, but I am telling you 
to let your dog tell you what level works rather than being caught up on the number because there's plenty of firm dogs that don't care about a 60, 70, or 80 on a mini educator when they're revved up or in drive. And that can be very unusual, especially if you're on a double collar where your other dog is working at a very different level. So it feels very weird, feels very strange, feels out of the ordinary, but it's just different dogs. So we've had dogs that are fairly small dogs go home on bosses that are being corrected very high initially, and then they eventually come down. But without that boss, without that ceiling, without that headroom, the owners would stay stuck and without the owners being willing to go higher to make that consequence valuable enough the dog's reactivity would just continue to cycle and cycle so that would be my suggestion is pay less attention to that number i know it's uncomfortable i know it's like oh you made that noise but what you're looking for is you're looking for transformation you're looking to find a level that helps your dog move through something so you don't have to do this forever so that you can eventually walk your dog down the street past other dogs and your dog knows i'm not supposed to behave like that but that's only going to happen when the consequence for making that crappy choice that has whatever payoff that it has for your dog is significant enough for your dog to make different decisions, different values, uh, you know, va different um, uh, assessments of values of decisions in those moments. So I hope that helps. Um, like I said, always uncomfortable. Nobody likes to correct their dogs hard or, or at high levels, but sometimes in order to help dogs break through, that's exactly what we need to do. So hopefully I can give you permission to try that and see what you get with it, and then uh, you can check back in with us, all right? Hope that helps. Oh, and uh, Rhonda, you were saying you were using space, so keep using that space, right? So I want you to keep the space going, but make sure you find the right levels, right? No pressure cooker, no walking right next to the dog, keep using the space, awesome tactic. Just make sure you find the right level. All right, good to see ya. Question number four from Valerie. Hey guys, I successfully smuggled the e-collar and prong to the island last week. We've, we've got the prong collar on and rocking, but I had a slightly traumatic event with the e-collar. I found his working levels pretty easily. I was messing around with the collar later on and switched the buttons to continuous and boost. I forgot that I switched them around, and the next time we used it, I blasted him with the new boost a few times before I realized what was going on. Felt like such a bad dog mom. E-collar fail. He's over it. I am the traumatized one, so we are moving slowly so I can gain my confidence back. Anyways, I just have a quick question. How much time in a day do you guys spend training an average dog who's in for a board and train? I know I am new to this, so it will take Sasha and I longer to get the hang of it, but for example, Auto sit. We have been working on that for months. Granted, it's it was on the hall tee, but I think he knows what he's supposed to be doing. Most days he'll put his butt on the ground with the slightest amount of leash pressure, but other days he'll act completely and totally clueless, even, even since switching to the prong. I have to do full leash pressure, then a verbal cue, then pressing down on his backside. It's like this with most of his commands, actually all of them, with the exception of his place command. So I'm wondering if I'm not doing enough repetition and as a result, he really doesn't understand the commands yet or if he's just being a mega brat <laughs> who hasn't been receiving consequences that are meaningful enough so that he consistently does what is expected of him. Thanks. <laughs> so what's your vote? Do you think it's the former or the latter? The latter. <laughs> <laughs> so mega brat or he just doesn't know after months? He's a brat. <laughs> Thanks, Shelby. <laughs> the quick verdict. Hmm. Okay, I'm in the car again. So I am not going to look at you. I'm going to look at the road. But I did, I just love this question, Valerie. I think it's such a great question. So the, the reason why I love it is because you've got a brat on your hands and not a mega brat like you said well I can't really say that because I don't know your dog but my guess is that you just have kind of a dog who has learned that he or she doesn't have to do anything unless you kind of like push the push the message a little bit so it's not like you have this like mega brat who's like oh I'm never gonna do what you say it's just it's like it's like if every time I asked you to do something you don't like. I asked you, the pattern was I asked you to do it. I asked you again at 
in the evening time that I asked you the next day and finally that next afternoon and this is something you hate to do or just that you just don't want to do then that next afternoon I halfway finish it for you and just have you do like the final bit does that make sense so <laughs> with you you've been working on the halty for a long time which just doesn't have like a consequence built in it's it's a great like you know tool for dogs who are just kind of like light and easy dogs for the walk and stuff but we don't use them for any sort of like consequence stuff because there is no consequence there really it actually it's a consequence in terms of like the dog being pulled around but you're not actually giving like an actual um correction or something for a choice to blow something off so the auto sit of course your dog knows what what the the sit is and of course your dog knows all these other behaviors and like you said like <clears throat> your dog's fine doing place command but that's probably because place command is some like tempurpedic like nice bed that he gets to go lay on and the rest of it is just kind of no fun and what happens is he doesn't get a correction all he gets is like asking him again telling him to do it again telling him like this is what we're gonna do and then all of a sudden you push his butt down or you add more leash pressure or whatever you're doing so your dog's not a brat your dog's just kind of like a normal dog that's just like hey if I don't have to do the work I don't have to do the work there are dogs of course that will like look into your eyes and be like I just want to do what you ask and but to be honest in our opinion or in our experience there's just not that many dogs that do that. Like there, you, there are definitely magical dogs out there, don't get me wrong, that are what people say eager to please, but I would venture to say there's far fewer of them than what people actually think. Like I always love the example of Belle. Belle is Sean's dog who's like golden dog. She doesn't do anything. She's never been reactive. She's never been aggressive with dogs, humans. She's perfect. The main thing that she does that's like bad is bad is like she freaks out at the um, smoke detector. But that's just like weird fear stuff. So, or weird, you know, whatever it is. So that's, it's nothing. She's a golden dog, but man, if she wants to go outside and she's kind of walking outside and you're like, Belle, come here. She looks back at you like, mm. and she's not a brat. She's just like, why would I do that? I'm cool. And she's not doing it out of disrespect or anything like that. She just wants to go outside. So I'm guessing that's what your dog has going on. Your dog might be a mega brat, but what I think with the mega brat stuff you see is a lot more fight. So less, less apathy and less like, oh, I'm just not going to do it unless you push me into it. And more like, you start pushing me, you start giving leash pressure, you start adding pressure to it, and I start to like come back at you, or I start to like, you know, not even like aggressively come back at you, but just sort of like fight and paw and bite the leash and stuff like that. That would be more like mega brat style. So you've got an e-collar, you smuggled in your e-collar. So all that said, you smuggled in your e-collar and prong collar. I can't say that that's good or bad. I don't condone or deny or support or whatever <laughs> but good for you um uh don't put your collar on boost anymore and don't make mistakes like that we all make mistakes but the 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 mistakes that you want to make with collars are small so let's not mess around with boost levels anymore um so as for your main question your main question, and I know you know that about the boost levels, I know you said that you're having major guilt, so I didn't mean to add to it, I'm just kind of like reiterating the fact. Um, but for for the, for the board and train dogs, you know, they're in for like a boot camp program, which is like an all day, all inclusive program, but it doesn't mean that they're working 24 hours a day actively. What we typically do is our active sessions are about 90 minutes to two hours per dog. And that's going to include, that's gonna be maybe broken up like maybe 90 minutes doing interior work or whatever the dog needs for that day outside, socialization, working dog-dog aggression protocols, whatever. And maybe another 30 minutes like if they 
they were on the walks in the morning and we wanted to really, really power through some of the walk issues, we might bring other dogs out or something like that and kind of augment the program. But it's not like split up all over the day. They're not like training and then going back in their crates, training, going back in their crates. They're pretty much like out actively working for about one and a half to two hours a day. Um, that's not including though, you know, walks where that's huge work. That's not including coming in and out of the crate, which is huge work. That's not including being quiet in the crate, not whining, not pushing when they get their food, none of that stuff. So that, that isn't included in that 90 minutes. That's like the all day part of it. So when you're working with your dog, the cool thing is your dog lives with you. So it's not like you're doing like a board and train where you need to get through several dogs throughout the day. This is your dog. So what you're going to do is do a ton of passive training. And what do I mean by that? There's plenty of times during your day, I'm sure. So ones that are pretty typical of owners are TV time at night or when you read a book at night, you know, kind of unwinding time on the couch. Um, morning time when you're getting ready, shower, makeup on, all that stuff. Um, cooking dinner, cooking breakfast, making lunch, depending on your work schedule, anything like that. So anytime that you're doing something, your dog is going to be working. And by working, I mean just in place command, not at your feet, but in place command in the house, somewhere where you can reinforce the command with the e-collar uh, if necessary. And that's just, that's not gonna be on your dog's like, oh, I wanna be on this pillow. It's whatever pillow or bed you decide that your dog goes on, that's what he's actually going to be staying on. So that is your active work. Then you have the walk, which is going to be active work, especially as you're starting out all of these new new tools and new protocols, you're going to be actively working with the dog. So you're gonna be doing auto sits at corners or whenever you stop, you're gonna be doing thresholds coming in and out of the crate, you're gonna be do, doing thresholds at the door. Anything that comes up that's, that, that is training moments, you're going to be enforcing. So those, you're not even gonna think of those as like, time spent it's just gonna be there's no other way um, so the way I live with my dogs is a little looser than that because they're they're kind of past like the training phase but any moment that is you know if we're going out the gate they're like they're waiting there until I release them and then they're walking next to me in a heel and then we're walking and they're not looking at other dogs even Cujo who's got nothing but just excitement and love for other dogs I don't even want him staring I don't want him loading I don't want him getting in that place with the other dogs so I'm correcting lightly for that they sit at corners with me etc and then during the day if I'm home working oops Sean just just called and uh, broke into my my speech on that but I'm reinforcing no excessive barking for Cujo I'm reinforcing you know no like um, squirrel chasing for Hercules stuff like that so anyway that's that's kind of what I want you to do I want you to just whenever you're out doing your passive kind of work stuff cooking cleaning whatever your dog's out working too so that's gonna be your work and then the rest of the little moments are gonna fill that in I hope that makes sense, um, but you know, your dog's not a mega brat, just maybe a light opportunist, and that's really no big deal. So get on those tools and have fun with it, okay? And, and relax with it, it's all fun, it's just dog training. Nice work, Laura, whatever you said. Action. Hey, Sean. <laughs> Questions from Sean, or she said... Question number five. Oh, number, question number five. Hi, Sean and Laura. First off, I love the dual location Q&A last week. The gum thing was hysterical. The whole show was great. Her question is, um, I have a two and a half year old yellow lab on his fourth day of board and train. His owners adopted him from the shelter about three months ago. He has a serious list of issues, lunging and biting at strangers, counter surfing, chasing, and attacking skateboards. I just started him on e-collar and he's done great so far with corrections on those issues. My question is, he is obsessed with reflections, shadows, etc. It's like he was endlessly teased with a laser pointer. Um, he, 
He hard freezes and stares. Today on his walk, he caught the reflection from my watch and I gave heel command with the collar and he snapped out of it. Same thing when he was in place, but said no with a tap. He doesn't always snap out of it so quickly and I have to roll up pretty high. Am I adding more superstitious stuff, the e-collar, to this behavior making it worse? Behavior is stopping at a high level, but this is new for me. We just started and I don't want to screw him up more. Have you ever dealt with this before and how? Thank you. Love you guys. Love you too. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we got Sean. Um, Sean has got a two and a half, Sean's a trainer, by the way, trainer and a friend of ours. Um, two and a half year old lab with lots of issues, boatload of issues. And, um, and one of the main things that Sean's asking about is the dog has shadow light obsession stuff, like shadows and light is, are causing the dog to be obsessive and staring and looking and, and, and constantly um, fixating um, on, on that stuff is bad news right and she was she was kind of asking it that, that it looks like a bit of a laser pointer induced thing which is super common um, I think 99% of the times when we find dogs that have got shadow and light stuff it's been induced or created through laser pointers so don't use later laser pointers even if this dog didn't get laser pointer treatment um, don't use laser pointers with your dog because you will most likely create obsessive behaviors that are going to be a real drag for you and your dog and you'll find yourself a really neurotic dog and it's very challenging to turn around. So, okay, so moving on from that, so it's still super early in the process. I think you said you were four days in at the, at the time of this post, so you got a long ways to go, a lot of time, a lot of stuff to work on, but like you said, this dog's got a ton of problems, a ton of issues. Um, it's not like it's just come in for the light and shadow obsession. This dog's come in for a whole host of issues, which means in, in the positive sense that the dog's state of mind is a bit out of whack, right? And I don't mean out of whack permanently, I just mean the dog's state of mind is a mess right now, currently. So, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to focus on a comprehensive program of getting the dog's mindset into a relaxed, chilled out, you know the drill, relaxed, chilled out, easy, less stressed, less anxious place so we can kind of see what we're dealing with. A lot of times our obsessive guys that come in, whether it's with light fixations or if it's with um, self-mutilation or spinning or anything like that or chewing, stuff like that, we typically see that stuff dissipate and go away through a more comprehensive approach of training and you know how to do that exactly how we do it. So what I would suggest is be patient, know that you're early in the process, go for the full comprehensive program, really, really focus on duration work, really focus on getting that dog's brain to slow down. The, the, the obsessive stuff tends to be from wound up, like edgy, edgy kind of stuff. And if you can get the dog to slow down, you'll really be doing yourself and him a, a big favor. So that'd be one of the big, big focal points for me. And then on top of that, I would also be going for correcting, you were asking like, can I correct for the laser pointer fixation? I don't want to make them worse. I would absolutely be correcting for the laser pointer fixation, right? So within reason if if it's literally like a non-stop parade of corrections and you're gonna have to pick your battles and that can be challenging about where do i correct and where do i not correct you're not going to mess the dog up by correcting but my point is that if you've got like non-stop stuff going on like this which i'm hoping it's not that bad um correcting constantly is going to create a more stressed out dog if that's the case so what we want to do is pick moments where hopefully We've got the dog into a more relaxed, chilled out, comprehensive space and he's looking much better. And then you see the occasional like old habit like resurface and you correct it firmly and you basically reset the brain and start a new pattern, right? So this dog is used, used to channeling out whatever nervous, insecure, freaked out, overwhelmed, obsessive energy that it's got and doing it with fixation stuff and then a whole host of other behavioral issues. So the good news is you have a lot of stuff to tackle to see what it does for the overall brain. If it was just, like I said, if it was just that one issue, I'd be far more concerned, honestly. If it was just the laser point, not laser pointer, but just the light and shadow fixation, I'd be much more concerned because you'd have a lot less to work with. 
but because you've got so much going wrong with this dog, you've got a ton of stuff that you can work with, a ton of stuff that you can start to tweak, a ton of stuff that you can start to turn around and then create some leverage to go after that, that light fixation and shadow stuff. So, and then correct it when you see it, right? You're not gonna make it worse. It's already worse. It's already bad. Oh, we got some. A little, a little natural color here. And hey. So, this seems like as good of time as any to close out the show, right? We got Nola style, we got. <laughs> we got people bumping, we got people screaming and yelling, we've got all sorts of antics going on. So, anyways. Uh, Hopefully those questions are helpful, guys. Um, had a lot of fun doing this episode uh, last week with, uh, with us kind of like in different parts and, and you guys, uh, or different areas or locations, and you guys seem to enjoy it as well. So this will be the last week, I think, because we'll be coming back from New Orleans, back to LA to get to work, whole host of dogs coming in, lots of work to do, lots of naughty dogs to wrangle. So, oops, try not to trip people. So anyways, thanks for Thanks as always for joining us, and uh, we will see you guys soon. I trust that Laura will do awesome, fabulous editing and all sorts of funky monkey business with this to make this super duper awesome. I'm gonna let these guys. I'm gonna let these guys work their thing out, and I'm gonna go. Uh, I've got a, I've got a uh, client. I've got to go see in about 20 minutes. So I'm gonna split, get out of here, let you guys do your thing. And I uh, hope those answers were helpful. And uh, keep them coming. Thanks for the support. Thanks for watching. We love you guys. And uh, we'll see you soon. And we'll be reunited soon, right? Cool. See you guys. Bye. We love you guys. Mm-hmm.